the magnetospheric multi-scale mission. NASA EDGE goes behind the scenes with the engineers and scientists preparing these satellites for flight. What kind of tests do they run? Why are these tests important? Find out more as they move one step closer to launch. Next on NASA EDGE. Hey guys, we're back in the studio once again to talk about one of our favorite topics or missions, the Magnetospheric Multiscale Mission. Or MMS. Or MMS. In studio today, uh, we're going to have Troy Klein, who's the Education and Public Outreach Manager, and he has some cool activities he's going to share with us in the show. I know I'm actually like baffled and amazed by these props, and I, I look forward to the explanation, but I'm also trying to work on stacking right now, which is an important part of MMS. Four models for four identical satellites. And we're actually going to talk about the testing of these satellites. Each of us actually had an opportunity to sit down with an engineer to talk about exactly what they do to get these uh, uh, satellites ready for flight. Yeah, I was first up talking with uh, Joanne Baker. She's the integration and test manager for MMS. And she's responsible for all the environmental testing that went on for each of the spacecraft. Well, my job is to organize um, all the activities that go into putting the spacecraft together and testing it. So that also includes coordinating all the different teams to work on the spacecraft, put it together, to coordinate the facilities, to make sure that we're ready for various tests and get all the equipment ready and actually get the test run. Sounds like a pretty complex task. I mean, how challenging is that? It's, it can be very challenging. I mean, especially with four spacecraft. <laughs> yes, and, and so it's been quite a juggling act. Now, what's the status of, of the four spacecraft now? Well, three of them are built, and we are running the what we call the environmental tests which basically puts the spacecraft in different flight-like environments and, and we verify that they are still working. And then the fourth one we're still putting together and it should be ready in a few months. Now when you say environmental test, is that the same as saying like you're putting it through a vibration test to see how the, the spacecraft would hold up on launch? Yeah, well we go through, there's several tests that we run. There's a, as you said, vibration test, which basically what we're doing is we're simulating a launch vehicle. You know, there's a lot of vibration during launch, and so we just need to make sure that we can survive that. We also do what we call an EMI test, which is electromagnetic interference test, and we verify that all the components can operate together, and then we also try to figure out, you know, where are they susceptible to noise, so that we have some basic understanding of where our parameters are. I understand what, with this particular mission, it's going to be in the magnetosphere of the Earth, and you're going to be taking a lot of sensitive data. So I'm assuming that the instruments are really sensitive for this mission? Yes. In fact, um, I think that's, that's probably one of the biggest things about this mission is that we, we are very highly sensitive. We have to be very careful about magnetics and not contaminating the spacecraft magnetically. So we have to do things like be careful about the tools that we use so that we don't transfer magnetics from the tools to the spacecraft. We have to keep things away from the spacecraft like motors or anything like that that would cause the magnetic field to transfer to the spacecraft. Like for the vibration test, there's big motors in the vibration table that create a lot of magnetic fields. And so what we had to do was we had to test the tables and make sure that we were far enough away from the tables when we ran the test so that none of those fields would affect the spacecraft. Are you building all four spacecraft at the same time? Are you, are you building them in parallel or in series? We kind of did them in a little staggered parallel effort. So we started with the first one and, and the first one was almost like our guinea pig. We learned a lot from putting that first one together. So it took a little longer. And then as we built each of the subsequent ones, we got a little smarter and faster at each each of the builds. So by the time you get to this fourth spacecraft, you're just going to whip it out like it's, yeah. like it's not right <laughs> Yeah, hopefully it'll go a lot smoother. Let's put it that way. <laughs> now, at what point do you know that you've done your job? Really, it's when we see it go up and we see it all work. You know, once we get through the the initial turn-ons and making sure that everything came up okay, that's really the payoff when that happens. I guess the big question is, how can we do some testing of our own with the models? Well, we can actually take these, you know, models and go in a car and drive off-road, and we <laughs> yeah. can do it. That would be a good shake tip. Yeah. Shake test, yep, mm -hmm. sure. But oh, a record player, microwave oven, maybe? Absolutely. Uh, you know. uh, it's, it's an important point. I mean, you, you, if you think about four spacecraft going to the harshness of space, if you don't test for the, all those conditions, you never know how it's going to react. And what struck me is that the environments are different at each stage. You have a different environment in the clean room when you're just building and testing the equipment, make sure it's okay. 
launch an entirely different environment. It's very uh, rugged, right. uh, very uh, a lot of vibration, and then space, vast temperature changes. So you've got to test every situation these will encounter along their way. Right. One thing that Joanne talked about uh, specifically was that the electromagnetic interference that the MMS would mm -hmm. encounter in space, Good point. and through magnetic reconnection, they need to make sure that the instruments, the suite of instruments on, on the spacecraft were going to operate. So uh, taking care of that here on the ground was uh, definitely important. So what you're saying is, is the people that work in the clean room are definitely not wearing footy pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't want to drag your foot and touch anything. Yeah, exactly. But, but if you did, you want to make sure that the spacecraft is uh, protected. And another part of the testing process is thermal testing. I sat down with Ramel Zaro, who was a thermal engineer, and he told us all about the process. Ramel, what exactly is a thermal engineer? A thermal engineer is responsible for the thermal control system of a satellite. And that involves the heating and cooling of specific components and instruments within the spacecraft. Uh, similar to a house, you have a heating system and a cooling system, you know, with a furnace and the air conditioning system. Satellite also needs thermal control system for heating and cooling to withstand the rigors of the space environment. You know, the hot temperatures in front of the sun and the very cold temperatures behind the Earth. So you basically have to go to the NRL, which is the chamber where MMS is stored for the thermal test, mm -hmm. and you have to build the heaters that are used to heat it up, the chamber, sure. or cool it down. That's right. So yeah, so we have a fixture that we call the hamster cage. Essentially, it's a giant fixture, maybe 15 foot in diameter. Imagine a hamster cage wheel. Yeah. If you turn it to its side, horizontal, that houses our, one of our MMS spacecraft. And within that cage, we have a bunch of panels that we control temperature to simulate the space environment. Hypothetically speaking, you get a failure. What is your next action? So, yeah, event? so a failure can mean many things. You know, it can be as small as maybe a temperature is off by a couple degrees, right? That's a small failure. It could be as large as a, a huge box not performing or just being dead. So depending on the type of failure, you know, the mitigation steps can be wide varying. And typically we would test to make sure we understand the problem. So we'll cycle it hot and cold, power it on and off to see if we can diagnose it. And we have a specific failure on our first observatory where we got a thermostat, a thermal control system hardware that actually failed during a cold cycle on a thruster. Uh, so that failure is, I'd say, uh, relatively mild in terms of the, uh, the range of, you know, drasticness, um, if that's even a word in Google. <laughs> but we decided to continue testing and to fix that after the thermal vac program. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tested a thermal detonator inside the... Uh... Thermal detonator? Yes. No, we, we try not to... Well, like, for example, pyrotechnics to, to cut mm -hmm. deployables. Mm -hmm. uh, we have done that, yes. So let me take that back. We have tested uh, pyros okay. uh, to make sure uh, deployable mechanisms work. Uh, you know, detonate a uh, small charge to, to cut a bolt. Are there any issues that are involved with testing a suite of satellites? Because I'm assuming you're testing one at a time. Yes, we are. But if you have to test four, what kind of time are we de we're talking about here? Right. I think the main challenge is just the, uh, the, the staffing and the time that you, you need to do multiple um, satellites. You know, one satellite alone takes about a month of testing, 24-7, around the clock, holidays, weekends, birthdays, it doesn't matter, you gotta be there. So with four, it just kinda quadruples the amount of effort that you gotta put in there. Now, because the satellite would go in orbits, in and out of, hot, cold, is that the way you test, go back and forth? Uh, yeah, so we have some simulations that specifically mimic those temperature swings in space. For example, MMS will have a long period in, in front of the sun where we're hot, and so we use our radiators to passively cool the system. But then when we get behind the Earth, we have these long eclipses that get really cold, you know, negative 273, absolute zero, deep space. And that's where we use heaters to simulate that cool down and then make sure that we don't freeze. A typical satellite, low Earth orbit, 30 minute eclipses, MMS, we have four hour eclipses. So that's one of the major challenges of our design is to keep from freezing um, in this long eclipse. So, so, so what happens? It, I'm, I'm thinking of a movie. It's, it's always that movie. A thermal vac movie, huh? Well, not a thermal vac movie. It might be a disaster movie. Okay. Someone's in a control room, feet up, test is running. Right. 
and there's a failure. Does a siren go off? Do you, you do your numbers change? Do they go from oh, blue yeah. to red? Well, what happens? Exactly like you said, we have sirens actually, alarms. So when we hit, for example, a temperature requirement it gets exceeded, it gets too hot, it gets mm -hmm. too cold, the alarm will beep at you, and you get startled, you get up. Uh, other failures like LN2 might be leaking, and all of a sudden you get a cloud of gaseous nitrogen like oh dude stop playing that's, Gallagher that's when you stop shut the that's DVD right. off that's right we you gotta get, get up and but you don't go in the chamber no no the chamber you got uh, there's a process for opening that chamber back up and it's a long process you got to repressurize it that takes time and then you got to open it and then you got to roll the spacecraft out so that's a longer process but definitely there's uh, there's alarms that'll keep you awake if, if they get triggered <laughs> okay from a thermal engineering standpoint who would win out Mr. Freeze or the Human Torch? Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, I wear both, you know, I'm both superheroes. I keep it cool and I'm hot, you know, so it's, like, <laughs> so it's a tie. <laughs> Great interview with Ramel, but uh, Franklin, I'm concerned that you may have created a superhero faux pas in combining Marvel and DC. What did you do that intentionally? Yeah, well, maybe it wasn't the best comparison to make with regards to the extreme conditions that Ramel tests in. But uh, I guess you got the point. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Not a good answer. Comic Con <laughs> banned for life. <laughs> Troy Klein, what would you think about uh, Ramel and what he had? That to was say? a great interview. I really appreciate it when we can speak with scientists and engineers from such a complex mission, and they can come in and explain it at a level that actually I can grasp, and <laughs> if I can get it, everybody else can get it, including you, Blair. Well, that's that's true. <laughs> Although another now, uh, Ramel brought up a actually created a word, drasticness. He did. Which is, you know, I like the freestyle approach he took to the explanation, but I'm going to have to look that and one I up. And I understood what he meant, so isn't that the point of communication? <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So, use your context clues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Troy, you, you came and brought some uh, really yes, nice uh, uh, giveaways uh, today. Part of this is actually a bookmark. And if you have a smartphone, and That's you right. can use the QR code on the back of the bookmark That's to right. find more information about MMS. We've been using QR codes more and more on many of the products that we come out with because it's fun, actually, when you see a poster with a QR code on it and a satellite, how many people walk by and scan it with their code just so they can play with their QR reader or whatever it is that they have. But what's nice is instead of everything being confined to a piece of paper and the information, which sometimes can change depending on what happens with the mission, a QR code allows it to stay dynamic. So you can just go to a website that we keep updated and to the right page with having to fish through thousands of NASA web pages to find Which it. Which is certainly important, especially on a mission like this, because sure things is. are happening all the time. Schedule changes, updates. You want to know right. where the spacecraft is and what's going on, like with the thermal testing and whatnot. So mm -hmm. before we talk more about the wonderful props that, that you have brought, we do want to talk about a very important part of MMS, which is science. And we had the opportunity to talk to Deirdre Wendell, who actually talked about some theoretical aspects of the mission and so let's take a look at that interview. Deirdre, how will MMS actually help heliophysicists? It will provide 30 millisecond time measurements of electrons and this will allow us to at the same time measure much smaller spatial scales because in the previous missions they relied on the spin of the spacecraft which is four seconds and many things can change over four seconds so you do miss a lot of information that way. The other advantage that MMS will provide is that it will provide all three components of the electric field vector measurements, and that will allow us to measure electric fields parallel to the magnetic field, which is an important characteristic of magnetic reconnection. I'm going to have to take a lot of that on face value, but it's, it seems to me like essentially what you're saying is we're getting a high definition view of magnetic reconnection, in part because of the instruments, but also because of multiple spacecraft? Yes, the multiple spacecraft will allow us to disentangle things that are happening in time from what's changing in space. Now, how will learning what we learn about magnetic reconnection help us in the future moving forward in science? Understanding magnetic reconnection is important to understanding space weather because Space weather relies on coupling between the energy and the mass of the solar wind and the magnetic bubble of the Earth, the magnetosphere. And magnetic reconnection is the primary coupling mechanism between those two regions. 
Now, how do we study this reconnection currently before MMS? When they study magnetic reconnection through developing numerical simulations that attempt to reproduce the physics governing reconnection. Another method is to simulate reconnection in a laboratory experiment. There have been certain observations made in space that have contributed to our knowledge of reconnection, but the instrumentation up till now has been much more limited in its ability to provide details about the physics. Uh, so you currently have 3D models of magnetic reconnection? Well, recently some of the numerical simulations have incorporated the physics of all three dimensions rather than just two dimensions. And this is primarily because of an increase in computing power that we're able to do that. And this is very important for understanding the realistic physics of reconnection. Now, did you go 3D because you were bowing to pressure from all the summer blockbusters being presented in 3D, <laughs> or was there some other compelling reason to, to drive that? Well, I, the motivation was really that people understood that the physics changes when you include the third dimension. The magnetic topology is very different. It's much more complex. And so to advance our knowledge, it was, it was a natural next step. When MMS flies and we start to get data back from it, you'll be able to apply that data to the 3D models. Will it be able to confirm some of your theories or will it just make them give you a more accurate picture? It will probably confirm and disprove certain theories and as well as providing a more accurate picture and it may, it may very well present us with some surprises. That'd be fun. Yeah. So there might be a sequel. Yes, yeah, right, a 3D nice sequel. All right guys, I've gotta be honest with you. With the beard, I thought I looked far more intelligent. Well, distinguished. Yeah, or distinguished, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the interview revealed uh, that I'm, I'm not very smart. I tell you, I, it just blew me away to hear Deirdre talk about the things that are being done scientifically ahead of this launch that will actually confirm theories, that will actually uh, reveal things about magnetic reconnection that we literally at this point do not know. You know, that, that really brings in the importance of the whole idea of numeric numerical simulations and mathematics, the importance of mathematics along with the science and the engineering and the technology of a mission like this. Can you imagine what it would be like if something the size of a, the Grand Canyon, which the magnetic reconnection region when they touch in space, that little piece where they touch is roughly the size of the Grand Canyon. That's going thousands of miles an hour through space. The spacecraft, all four of which are going really fast at the same time, we have to try to bring those two events together and capture it, and she said in just milliseconds, so we, faster than you can blink your eye, is how wow. quickly all the instruments aboard these satellites are going to flash at the same time, or basically snap at the same time. There really are no cameras aboard. Mm -hmm. But to capture this entire event in 3D, and so that is partially what Deidre and the people like her are trying to simulate ahead of time through mathematics. My mind is folding at the drasticness of that uh, <laughs> illustration. Drasticness, yes, yeah. right, like that. <laughs> Trying to wrap your head around the just the the science and the engineering that have to come together to make that happen. That's Grand right. Canyon, that 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 thought of that is just mind blowing. Well, it is, and and one of one of my jobs is to, as an outreach specialist, is to try to find ways that we can bring people along for that journey. As the scientists and engineers are learning learning new ways and new information and all of this, we'd like for the public to be able to do the same thing. And about two years ago, there was a book that's called uh, Make to Learn. I can share it with you guys. This is cool. basically a hard copy okay. book that was created through an NSF grant in the University of Virginia. And what I noticed was they had two. 2D and 3D fabricators that they were they had on the side of, of one of the shows, and they were showing how students were actually able to explore something like wind turbines and electrical power output out of paper models. So wow. I thought, well, can we do this with the MMS mission? And so I went right up to the people who created this, and I said, hey, you know, we have a new mission going up and it's being built right now. Why not get on board at the ground level as the mission is being developed and help us come up with a storyline and a storybook that does some of the same things that you're doing in this transmedia book. In the end of it all, 
they created Imaginetic Space, which is a student book talking about a little boy who is on a school bus. He receives a tweet from NASA that says space weather storm in process. And that's progress. real. That's no joke. And I that's mean, no we, joke. That really do. happens. Yes, absolutely. And there's some intense storms that happen. Mm -hmm. Well, this kind of concerned him, and he went to his classroom in the story, talks to his teacher, and they end up getting in touch with an engineer from the MMS mission in the story. And that ushers you into the whole process of 2D and 3D fabrication. If people don't have 2D fabricators or 3D fabricators, there are uh, alternate methods that you can use to create the whole process. After Imaginetic Space was created for students, we created a piece of technology, an iBook for the iPad or iPhone, and that will train people how to do all of the activities and we'll embed it with videos and how-to videos and we'll also add all the science standards, technology standards and then we'll create extension activities so that if you'd like to journal what your students are doing with the Student Transmedia book you can online with about 25 different ed tech uh, tools that they introduce through the book. By the time MMS launches, would we be able to read some of those journal entries and maybe talk about them? Yeah, uh, students are actually using the book right now. We awesome. have students in a place called Dublin, Texas. I don't know if you've ever been. It's a very underserved community, but they came to us and said we would love to use these materials and test out some 2D fabricators, maybe 3D fabricators, creating different models of the spacecraft, for instance. They're actually even considering trying to create out of a 2D fabricator and paper models a clean room to understand part of the engineering process, and that I, really blew me away. I've, I've built a clean room before. That's no easy task. <laughs> I although, saw that episode. Although I could have used a 2 and 3D printer. I mean, I'm sure that, that would be the one missing ingredient. <laughs> that might ingredient have changed the outcome might, of that episode. That might have well, you know, if you had uh, uh, something like an iBook here, you may have been able to help you through that process Absolutely. of putting together your, your clean room. Then you could have scaled it up to the size that you actually had it and may have worked. Franklin, you're, you're reminding me that I can try again. Yes, you I, can. I, I, there's still opportunity out there for, for me to learn and grow. Well, there is, and it actually reminds me of a, yet another school district I have to tell you about in West Virginia. And this is a small school in Paw Paw, West Virginia. They came to us and said, you know, we're really excited about Imagine Space and the modeling and all of the engineering science. We would like to build a life-size model out of plywood, balsa wood. They even found solar panels that they're going to use to create that. And uh, what's really nice is theirs, going, theirs is going to be, you know, one-to-one. -one. It'll be a full-size scale model. Wow. So you can imagine the antenna go out 60 meters. That's 180 feet apiece. So I'm not sure how big the gymnasium is going to have to be to contain the... They'll have to take it out to the football field. They'll have to, and they'll have a series of activities and workshops and blueprints that they create uh, based on their model that will travel around the state and hopefully... Travel around the state? Troy, mm -hmm. I don't think you realize what you've created in all this uh, through, through inspiring them. <laughs> no, you've actually created the fifth MMS satellite. If something goes wrong on the last one, they can just go to Paw Paw, uh, you know, negotiate a little bit and get I, that fifth supply. We need uh, to tell MMS the supply. students to get their uh, vacuum chamber prepared. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, they got some environmental Thermal testing. Test. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Troy, I tell you what, this is fantastic. It's really encouraging to see, you know, all that you've done, but really all the opportunities people have, That's not right. just to learn about it, but to get their hands dirty and from a scientific perspective. That's right. Thanks so much, Troy. Thanks You're for coming welcome. by, and we look forward to the next exciting episode following MMS. You're watching NASA Edge, an inside and outside look at all things MMS. <laughs> Good job, Troy. Thanks. Uh, Don't we get to keep these? You can. Awesome. 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 Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> <Gambling one. laughs>